Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this afternoon we're starting with Roland Coopers. <laughs> um, Roland is, is, is another of our uh, business um, speakers, um, and he's currently vice president strategy for Shell's liquid um, natural gas, um, the global business which is based in London. Now, he is also a theoretical physicist, um, but he did um, have a quite a long career, 11 years with AT&T. And that period that he was there, in fact, also coincided with tremendous transformation of the telecommunications industry, um, both as a business and its societal impact. Now, in 1998, Roland took a sabbatical to actually think and write about complexity. And it was the, as a product of that sabbatical, he wrote a paper that I read, I came, got in touch Sorry. with him. So that was um, the beginning of, of, of um, our um, relationship, shall we say, since, since then in terms with Shell and the LSE. Um, he subsequently joined Shell and he was also Vice President Sustainable Development and again we have done um, some work on sustainability um, while he was in that position. Um, and three of his interests which I think capture very much uh, some of the essence of what we're doing here for the next two days is sustainability, business and complexity. So, okay. I'm going to start by contradicting the first speaker because um, if I understand it correctly, after lunch your basic need is sleep uh, <laughs> and not a talk about sustainability, complexity and innovation. But nevertheless, uh, that's what we're going to attempt to do. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but if you're too right, then everybody will fall asleep. So. <laughs> Anyway, um, <clears throat> these are three big topics to connect, so um, you know, bear with me. I, I, it's, it's a subject I have some passion around, and I've wrestled to try to connect, because I think they are important, they're important linkages. But they're three pretty abstract concepts, so it, it's, a, it's, a a, it's a bit of a journey to, to weave it together, but also to, to share some understanding about, so what do we mean by sustainability, what do we mean by complexity, because they're all terms that <laughs> could have a debate around, them, around themselves. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it, it's something that, I, that, I've, that I've come to personally, as, as Eve said, because I've, I've, um, I've been with this topic for quite a long time. I actually graduated in fractals in physics, um, which was, you know, a long precursor that then evolved into complexity science. And, came back to it and, and, and then sustainability came in. So you sort of, if you look back at your life, there's always um, a logic as you build it, but it, it, it sounds rather strange to start with. Um, what I'd like to do is start with sustainability. <clears throat> and I'll give you some perspectives, some shell perspectives as well, because I was, re I was really thinking about this talk in terms of sustainability from, a, from the perspective of a large corporation that, as you all acknowledge, has stands in the middle of quite a lot of the sustainability challenges that we face. Um, so uh, it, will, it, it will be colored by, those, um, by, by that experience and those issues as a practical case. Um, just, just to talk about the definition of sustainability for a moment, the term that's en vogue now is CSR. In fact, um, Alexis here is uh, working on CSR in, in corporations for the London School of Economics. Um, but I, I just want to distinguish it a little bit from, from what I was thinking about in terms of sustainability, is that you can think of CSR, corporate social responsibility, as doing all sorts of things to be responsible in the community and not to, not to, do, not to pollute too much. And there are all sorts of things that you can do as an add-on to your business, which are really important. Um, but that, I would distinguish that from asking the questions about the systemic interactions of, of the corporation or of the organization you have with society. And so there, I think there's a deeper way of looking at sustainability in a company than just a lot of the debate around social responsibility. And so I'm, I, I would like to, to look at that deeper sense of, of what, what is the essence of the activity of the corporation contributes system, systemically 
um, and it's in its interaction with society and the natural world. And so it's just a distinction I wanted to make in the beginning because it, it takes us away from a lot of issues that are legitimate, like fat cat pay and all these things that are in the newspapers a lot, which are you know, issues in their own right, but a little bit of a distraction from the, from the, uh, from the more systemic issues. So why, just, why does a corporation actually get into this? Um, <clears throat> well, in the case of Shell, um, in, in order to get a corporation into motion as, as any complex system, you have to create a disequilibrium. Um, and, and, and because systems in themselves will rest happily in, in the equilibrium they can find. In the case of Shell, it was the, you know, the two external crises um, that many of you will remember, the Brent Spar um, crisis where there was a lot of outrage about a, a large tank that was going to be dumped in the sea. Um, and uh, the other thing was outrage around the, um, the, all the social issues in Nigeria. I won't go into those in detail, but there's a lot to be said about them, but what they served is as, from, if you look at it from a complexity point of view, they served as issues that took the system out of equilibrium and got it into motion. Um, now, then the question is, in which direction do you move once you're out of equilibrium? Because you can move to build bigger walls, or you can move to interact with society and so on. And I think that's the direction that was taken, or attempted to be taken. Um, you know, prompted by things like the Rio conference and the Johannesburg conference and so on, um, looking at, um, at the issues that face the world, which, which you know, in the, in the oil and gas industry, frankly, do stare you in the face. I mean, there are industries that are a little bit more insulated from these, for these, uh, from these large industries. So what does that do? What does that do to the way you look at your business? And this is just an image we've, we've attempted to create where well, you've got somebody you know, looking, standing on a set of business principles, as most corporations have, um, or many at least. Um, but as we've seen also with the famous examples of Enron, et cetera, having business principles in themselves is, is a nice thing, is a nice platform, but it doesn't actually deliver results. Um, so we see sustainable development as, as a lens, as this is a, as an image, a lens to look at your business, but you see the operations that you have today, but it allows you um, by, by seeing the context around that to actually be able to see through to where you're going tomorrow. Um, it's, I, I realize this, is, this is, is an image and images don't work for everybody, but it, it is an important aspect of, um, of our thinking to try to translate this as, as our artist here <laughs> does, to translate things into images and, and to say, well, what role does it play? And, what, and again, in, the term, in terms of complexity, what it does is it allows you to see uh, the interactions of the systems with the systems around it and to take a view of that and to learn from that. So that's how sustainability is positioned, um, which again is quite different from you know, the traditional corporate social responsibility things, which are you know, to appease communities and to make sure that you don't get nasty articles in the press. Um, very important as well. Um, so <clears throat> we get to an issue that was, was, I think you alluded to this morning also. So what about profitability and, and making money, which is, uh, which is important for corporations. Um, so how do we relate issues of sustainability and these systemic issues to the fact that you need financial returns? Um, there, there are two things we do. One is we articulate sustainability in the language of financial returns. We say, well, actually, there are a number of elements in there that, um, th that, that makes sense from a, from a very narrow business point of view, profit optimization point of view. And that's useful to communicate, at least with people who, for whom that's the paradigm. Um, and there are things like um, reduce cost through eco-efficiency. Uh, there are examples where we've been able to reduce environmental footprint and save money. Um, enhance reputation, influence the portfolio for the future. Those are, are really essential things to your core business. But the dilemma um, that you also face is that in, in the end, you, will, you won't be able to prove, if somebody's really cynical, you can't prove that, that for, a, for a commercial enterprise to look at issues of sustainability, um, you cannot demonstrate that that is, is optimizing shareholder value. Um, it certainly doesn't contradict it, and there are elements that contribute to it. But looking at the firm purely in terms of, um, of, of having its goal 
um, sharehold, optimizing shareholder return doesn't do the trick. You won't be able to, to, um, to engage in, 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 this, in this field. Um, so the, 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 re the way I, I interpret it for myself and, and in, the, in, the, in the people that I talk to is to look at um, high financial returns as a fitness criteria in the sense of a complex system. Um, it's a very important, um, just in a sense like for a human being, the absence of illness or the absence of not having a temperature is really important. But would you say the golden life is not having a fever? And, um, in, and, and it's a crude analogy, I think, for the financial returns of our, for a firm. It is very important to make a lot of money and to make more money than your competitors. Um, but in terms of, of the dynamics of complexity, it, it's, I think we should view it as a fitness criterion rather than a goal. And this distinction is quite important when you, when you start looking at issues of sustainability. Um, but you know, that being said, that's a nice intellectual analysis, perhaps. But then how do you progress? Um, how, do you, how do you harness the dynamics in, in a corporation in the size of Shell, um, or even a smaller one, so that, so that you put these issues on the agenda and basically start influencing the decisions that people make day to day? Um, because again, the, the dominating paradigm is that um, us business people get out of bed in the morning and our first thought is, how do we optimize shareholder return? This is what, what our immediate thought at breakfast are. Um, uh, and of course, um, that isn't true. Uh, but it is, it, is, it, is an, it is an important aspect of corporate life. Um, and, and, so, and, and it does drive, as in a complex system, a fitness criteria does, it drives a lot of the individual interactions between the agents and a lot of their, the, and, 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 and has consequences for the, for the um, emergent behavior of a, of a company. Um, so, as I've already alluded to in the language that I've used, um, you know, I think about a, a company, a large company, as a complex adaptive system. Um, and I think in this audience, I don't really need to explain the, uh, the images enough. In, 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 you know, um, into interactions between individual agents that, that through a set of rules and, and fitness criteria lead to, um, to behaviors and, and as the, uh, in the U.S. always look for bumper stickers for the ultimate wisdom, um, then emergence happens. So the question, if you, if you want to link sustainability um, and complexity in the context of a commercial firm, um, what do you need to do and how do you look at a commercial firm so that, um, so that um, you, you are able to get different uh, emergent behavior from, uh, from it? Um, and the, the, uh, the image that I would use there is, is to look at, the, at a company as a complex adaptive system that in itself interacts um, with the natural environment and with societal environment. Um, and that's one of the large reasons, I think, why uh, complexity in itself is, is very problematic. And if you look at, no disrespect to probably somebody here in the audience, but if you look at practical applications of complexity for commercial firms, um, the efforts mostly fall flat because it's extremely difficult to translate this into, um, in, into practical tools that people can use on Monday morning. Um, and the reason is that, that you know, most of the study of complex systems are about the dynamics of relatively simplified complex systems. And if you look at a, at a large commercial firm, not only in itself is it hugely complex, but it also interacts with the ultimate complex systems is the ecosystems and societal environment. Um, so, so we have to reason on, princip on abstract principle rather than in terms of uh, you know, tools to help management teams squeeze more out of their organization because um, in, in, at least in my experience that's a bit of a dead end street and, and you really don't, you really, certainly intellectually it isn't, certainly intellectually it, it doesn't hold water but um, practically you also see that there's very little, very little traction in that direction. Um, now, the, 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 the illusion among many people, including senior civil servants and, and academics in many cases, is they have a view of a commercial enterprise not at all as a complex adaptive system or as a social community, but very much as a, 
as a hierarchical system that if the if the boss and the you know ultimately the the CEO wants something and tells the organization to do that 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 then it then happens that that's the dominant mechanism for um, for for influencing um, influencing the path of a large company um, and according to that logic embarking on a path of sustainability would be quite simple right you know, just get the boss to say well actually you have to take these two or three other things into account and off you go now the reality um, as in the I'm sure in the organizations that you work in <laughs> is that it's nothing at all like that and I think there's some very interesting research I think it was in the Netherlands they looked at what percentage of decisions by boards actually led to any kind of effect inside of the organization and the percentage is extremely small uh, so what most boards do actually it, the, all the decisions that they, they expend a lot of heat on making actually don't lead to anything and, and uh, our own CEO Phil Watts of, of Shell has often said that you know he feels that he sits there on the 24th floor of this tower across Big Ben and pulling all sorts of levers that are actually aren't connected to anything <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, the, um, so, so, what, what, so what do they do? I mean, I think they do have a very, so, so I, why am I going into this a little bit explicitly? Is because it is, looking at a firm as a complex adaptive system is quite at odds with a dominant view of large corporations. Um, but, so boards and CEOs do have a very important role is that they do set fitness criteria, if you think about it as a complex adaptive system. They really have a very important role in that, in, in catalyzing and, and the values and, and, the, and the, the goals that will then, that individuals will then take um, and, and, and optimize all their interactions about. The other, diff the other thing that's very different about a commercial enterprise as, a, as, a, as any other social system, I think, and this is where the, the, the complexity analogy at least for me in, 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 in my spare time as I've been able to keep up with the literature collapses is that of course that people are not agents as we assume them in, in, um, in complex adaptive system and they actually have this thing that is hugely debated by philosophers but they do have freedom of choice to a certain extent and, and that, that, is, that, is, that really we should never forget that that is, a, is an important thing. And this, I think, determines the difference between business people getting up in the morning and mechanically thinking about optimizing shareholder return as opposed to coming to their work and exercising all sorts of freedom of choice within the stochastics of that big system they're in, somehow steering towards lots of making lots of money for the company as well. Um, and, and this is quite key, I think, to the sustainability agenda because to me the, 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 um, the, the point is how do, you get the, that, how do you get people to exercise some of that freedom of choice um, that they make in, or in their day-to-day -day decisions about investments and all sorts of you know, what they put on PowerPoint slides that day and so on, to take into account some of those, um, to take into account that larger context. So how do you get to that? to that individual behavior. Now one of, the, one of the other fallacies, of course, and I think that the, the, the talk um, <coughs> this morning um, also uh, alluded to that, is that we also have this, this image and, and vocabulary around very individual and segmented stakeholders. You know, we talk about shareholders and government and partners and customers and so on. Um, whereas th that also doesn't co is a mental model we've created that doesn't correspond to reality. Businesses outsource huge chunks of their um, of their work. Um, you know, if I just look at myself in terms of, of, of Shell, to be practical, you know, I'm a I'm an employee, I'm a customer, I'm a shareholder, um, and there are all sorts of other people who would have um, who would have these multiple roles, and therefore the interactions are actually intrinsically, and this back to the previous image, are, are intrinsically full of feedback loops everywhere. So, so there, is, there is a much more, and, and therefore, I think the, 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 um, the, the, the um, concepts of, of complexity and those dynamics really apply because that, the, and, and as you shift to this, to this different pattern. And it also puts a little bit of relativity around the shareholder value optimization because 
Yeah, I mean, you know, they may play that game when they sit at the shareholder meeting, but, but in actuality, they're also citizens and they have all these other roles. And, and so the, the, the reality is much murkier. Um, so how do you motivate these individual agents? Well, the, the agents, remember, with their, with their human freedom, are, are guided inside of this fitness landscape, inside of the firm, um, and financial, optimizing financial returns continues to be one of the important fitness criteria. And, I, and if I can put a little bit of an analogy, it was my reaction to the, to the talk this morning. A lot of the biological um, needs, you know, survival and, and, and all of that are, are things that drive our life, but they're not the exclusive ones. We can choose to add other elements to it. And in a sense, fi optimizing financial returns is a survival issue for corporations. I mean, you should never underestimate that. that you know, basically as a social system, um, employing people and so on, the firm dies if it doesn't make enough money. So, so it, it, it will be an important fitness criteria, but as I said before, humans will have, do have the choice to exercise, to exercise um, um, uh, free choice and set goals that in themselves, the sum of those choices will, will um, change the shape of the fitness landscape. Um, so their, their interaction, they will interact with, with the firm and that will, through, their, through their, their, their collective choices, it will change the, um, um, the shape of the fitness landscape. Uh, before we get completely lost in a sea of abstraction here, um, just give you two examples um, that, 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 that a company like Shell faces and um, that, that are the kinds of issues that we need to apply this thinking to. Um, one of the big issues, obviously, being an, an, um, an energy firm is climate change. Um, to put it very briefly, succinctly, we, um, we probably have, you know, people think we're running out of fossil fuels, but actually we probably have enough fossil fuels to destroy the climate. So that's, so the, the issue is, is, uh, is rather the other way around, is how do we manage our, our, our portfolio of, of energy and how do we get enough energy to the world? Um, and energy is, is hugely important for development. So it's not just a luxury, but it's really a basic need. Uh, for many people, but how do you get enough energy um, to the world so that, so that you actually have a sustainable uh, both social system in terms of some equity in, in getting access to energy, um, but also, um, which, which is you know, the argument, if you move everything to expensive renewables, then that may be fine for California, but it actually doesn't work for Senegal to stay with the images of, uh, of those particular countries. So what, you're, you're, well, so what you're trying to do is in this company that makes most of its money from, from oil and gas, which are, which are crucial and important uh, to development, to both developed and, and development, developing countries, how do you get people uh, to look at options um, that optimize, that, optimize um, uh, that, that, that move us in the direction of addressing the issues of climate change um, the easy solutions are often people say, well, why don't you, you know, just put a lot of money into solar panels and, and just stop producing oil and gas. Uh, we've actually tried that, and uh, we're one of the largest, Shell is one of the largest suppliers in the world of solar panels, but I don't know how many of you have got Shell solar panels on their roof and have exercised that choice that you have to move away from fossil fuels. But my guess is probably zero. Um, am I wrong? Um, I have them, actually. But, um, the, um, but so, the, so that's not the issue. The issue is how do you get a systemic transition over, over a period whereby you, you, take, you can take the rest of the, of the companies and customers with you. Um, and so one of the things we've done to, to, uh, to, in, to the first thing is to, to, to create consciousness without, within the company. So the first thing we've done is set targets for our own carbon, greenhouse gas emissions. When you, produce, um, when you produce petrol or, or gasoline, depending on which country you're in, um, you actually burn about 10 to 15 percent of the energy in, in just getting it to market, which is moving it, refining it, etc. So that process in itself creates quite a lot of, um, of greenhouse gases. So we've set targets to reduce that. And what that does is it, fine, it reduces it, um, which is important in itself. But what it does, it starts creating agents in the system that have actually thought this problem through and have got some affinity with it. And, um, and hopefully you, you create, you create a, a, um, a body of, of people who have the capacity to be able to innovate in this direction. 
and in their, in their, in their interactions with society, um, then, then afterwards take, take the system with them. Um, a second example um, is in, I've chosen the two hardest areas, actually. I could have took, taken fat cat pay, which is much simpler, I think, uh, is the issue of social performance. People look typically, and this is where this corporate social responsibility issue comes in, look at, at corporations and say, well, why don't you give some more money to um, you know, disadvantaged youths in, in the neighborhoods around your office buildings and so on, which, which are really important things, but, but in a sense, they're things that, that government probably can do better and, and should be doing. Um, so if companies, private companies, fill in the role of the, where governments are failing, that, that's nice and that's important, but you're really fixing a problem that, that's, that's not of our making. Um, and if you look at Shell, um, we spend about $125 million on social, classical social investment and philanthropy. Um, you could say $125 million is a lot of money, but, but in the bigger scheme of things, it actually isn't all that much. And the big, the big question on social performance is if you look at the other flows of money that are around, um, we, spend, we, we provide about $50 billion in taxes to governments, um, and thereby allowing them to fund <laughs> Uh, community development programs, etc. Twelve billion dollars of foreign direct investment, procurement of 25 billion, employing 100,000 people and directly employing a million people. So the question is, for me, in terms of sustainability, is how do you get your individual agents, when they make choices, to think in the dimensions of the social impact of the core business of the firm, as opposed to saying, oh, we've got a department who subsidizes the opera, so we're in great shape. So, so it is, again, about how do, you get, how do you get the individual agents of the system to be conscious of the interactions of the firm as a whole with its external world and, and apply some consequences, those that are within their control, to their individual decisions. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so if we come back to that, to that image of, of, the, of these agents interacting and, and the system as a whole interacting with the natural world and societal world, um, then the, 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 the key, as, as I've alluded to a number of times, for me is getting, the, is, is getting to the individual and, and somehow connecting the interactions of the whole firm to, 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 for people to, to understand what the consequences are for their own uh, um, behavior. And, and you could say, well, fine, you know, put it all down to the poor employees who aren't doing the, <laughs> who aren't doing the job. Um, but it ties in, and this is where innovation, I think, comes in. It, it really um, is get, getting, um, translating those interactions into a different way of doing things is fundamentally a process of innovation and learning. Um, our current ways of doing things will not, you know, incrementally or tweaking them get, get us there. Um, so the, the, the example of climate change I've, I've, I've given is you're trying to create a climate, it's a bad, bad word in this, in bad analogies, but you're trying to create an, an, um, a, a corporate culture whereby people are conscious of these things and, if you, and, and that innovative ideas and that technical innovation um, will, be, will be steered in the direction that it takes into account that the reflexes of the people are, will be to take account social and, and, and these social and environmental issues. Um, so it is really, ultimately, you're, you're creating an enabling dynamic but that, 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 that uh, allows the innovation engine of the firm to, to, um, to, be, to be steered in a certain direction. Um, and then hopefully, it'll always be tested against financial returns. You know, if something's a great idea, but it doesn't make any money, then it just won't happen. Um, so, so there's no choice. It's through the engagement um, with the external environment, you set the agenda, you stimulate the, um, the, the, the social and the technical innovation capabilities of the firm um, in order uh, to have that translated into the main fitness criteria of, of high financial returns. Um, so in conclusion, um, what, what, is, what does complexity tell us? Well, um, we have, um, through a high interaction, high density, what you, one of the things you want to do if you're looking at a sustainable, a sustainable development agenda for a large firm, you want to make sure you've got a, a suitably high density of interaction with the outside world. 
It's usually what you call stakeholder engagement in the world of, in the, in the language of CSR. But if you look, if you think about it in terms of complex systems, what you're trying to do is, is, is increase the density of interaction because that will create emergent behaviors. Um, but you need to set a direction for the innovation engine. So the fitness criteria of, of making lots of money has to be complemented with other fitness criteria that will influence the individual agents. Um, and that you, you, you have to do with the kinds of examples of translating some of these goals from external, um, from external engagements that, that individuals will be able to steer. Um, and, and then into, in a certain sense, you know, let the fitness criteria run. You, you, you will just have to, um, to allow experiments to happen and, and things to fail and ideas to come up. Um, that, that leads to a, to a very practical issue is how do you organize this stuff in a company? And, and you know, many companies um, put their sustainability efforts with the traditional health and safety departments or with their external affairs departments. Um, and and it, I think it's important to distinguish when you think of it, about this in these terms of, of complex dynamics, what do health and safety departments and external affairs departments do is they try to manage things to a means. They really don't want fluctuations about the average and for very good reasons because people die if you, if you, uh, if you lapse, if you experiment too much in the safety areas. So it's an, it's an environment of control of, of really clamping down on processes and making sure you have no fluctuations around the mean. Um, and the same is true in external affairs. If you walk through an external affairs department of a large firm, people are you know, reading the newspapers, are paranoid of some peak or somebody saying something in a newspaper that will be outside of the mean. They're really trying to manage things to, uh, to, uh, to, to an average. Um, if you tie this sustainability agenda to, uh, to the core innovation engine and to, this, to, these complex, to these complexity dynamics, this will never work because you're actually completely dependent on, on these stochastics and on, 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 on fluctuations and on people coming up with ideas that wouldn't work. So you need a very different environment. Um, and and you, so that's why um, I think you need to tie, to tie it and you have to determine what actually is the innovation core of your organization, which is often very hard to find. It's not an easy question to answer because it's often distributed. It's a number of people that are talented. It's not necessarily a department. Um, but it's just a plea to, if we, if we come back to our, our three big words of sustainability, complexity, and innovation, is in order to get um, commercial firms to, to pay more attention to sustainability issues, you have to find a way to hook it into their in innovation capabilities. Um, and really recognize the value that, that looking at things as a, um, as a complex adaptive system will, will, um, will bring tying, tying those three things together. So in a sense, it's a new twist on innovation. It's a twist on sustainability as well. Um, and, and um, you know, not, not forgetting the, the commercial reality of companies and this, this, this need to meet that really important fitness criteria in order for them not to die, which, which is, uh, as, as any, any entity, whether is, is, um, will be their first concern. <laughs> so um, that's basically what I, what I wanted to, to try to get across. Um, so thank you very much.